Hello all, it's the old geek and I'm gonna go back to my roots with this video and I'm reviewing an AD&D module. This one, S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. But geek, you don't like sci-fi. You've made a point of saying how you want to keep sci-fi out of your medieval fantasy. Well, I decided to challenge myself. I put a poll in my channel listing four modules, none of which were really my thing. And I asked my subscribers to vote for which one they most wanted me to run. And this one won by a mile. So I did. And these are my opinions regarding it. I do pride myself on at least trying to be objective. So I will attempt to be just that in this review. If I enjoyed something about this adventure, I will say so. If there was a problem, I will say so. S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, was written by Gary Gygax, and the AD&D version was published back in 1980. But it was first seen at the Origins 2 convention back in 1976, where it was a scenario intended for Metamorphosis Alpha. The intended party size is large, huge, up to 15 PCs, and fairly high level with a recommended level range of 8 through to 12. It has been updated twice in recent years for 5th edition D&D. Firstly by Goodman Games, and they expanded upon the original somewhat, and then secondly by Wizards of the Coast, in a recent compilation of converted old adventures. Dungeon Magazine placed it fifth in their list of the greatest D&D adventures of all time, which is high praise from people within the industry. But what do I think of it now that I have run it? Presentation. It's a beefy adventure. The cover art is viewed by many as being a classic. It's Errol Otis. There are six maps. There are two on the inside cover and four more on a second inner cover. Then the adventure itself is spread over two booklets. A 32 page main adventure booklet and an extra booklet containing more than 60 numbered illustrations. The DM is intended to use these to help describe the environment to the players. Cover art, as I've already said, Errol Otis, and Otis's work also features heavily in the adventure itself. His style lends itself to this type of adventure very well. He's got this otherworldly weirdness, and that is perfect for this adventure's atmosphere. There are other regular artist names in there. Jeff D, Jim Rosloff, Dave Sutherland, and others. The variety and sheer volume of art is impressive, but the maps are awful, unless you are somehow blessed with microscopic vision. Shading is used to differentiate between areas of differing levels of lighting in the adventure too, and the shading for the darkest areas is, well, um, too dark. Text is presented using the somewhat ugly, dense font commonly seen in TSR modules of the day, but at least bolding has been used to make some key points stand out. I love it or loathe it, there is no boxed text. Of the 32 pages in the main booklet, just over half are used to describe the adventure locations, so there's about 18. There are about 10 pages of new items and monsters. And those 10 pages go into a lot of detail. The dungeon, dungeon, more of that in a bit, covers six levels, and all of that is described in about 18 pages. Hmm. But it's about time I put in a spoiler warning, so from now on, there will be spoilers. But it's not as if I'll be revealing anything new, as there will be very few people watching this video who are unaware that the dungeon in this adventure 
is a spaceship. A very big one. It is buried beneath Greyhawk's barrier peaks and has been there undiscovered for a long time. Recent earthquakes have revealed a couple of metallic doorways, one of which is now opening and closing and allowing things to escape. The party must investigate these strange doorways and find out where these things are coming from. So, it's a dungeon crawl with a twist. A very, very big dungeon crawl. Just look at the size of level one. Just look at all those unlabeled rooms. I haven't counted, but I would estimate there's in the region of 120 of them, maybe more. And this level comprises just over five pages of the book. There's about 15 detailed areas, plus generic area descriptions. The empty areas are simply described as having been looted, containing remains of long dead crew members and useless junk. And this is level two. Level two is all described in less than one page. Responsibility falls squarely on DMs to describe most of this themselves and fill in the gaps. And not being a sci-fi buff, I found this difficult. There are simply too many gaps to fill in, and thus it can very quickly become repetitive. I had some pre-prepared things that I wanted to put into these rooms, but there weren't 120 of them. I ran out of these added descriptions pretty quickly. It's a lot of work. The spaceship's current denizens are interesting. There's a variety of androids and robots, some helpful, some out of control, and some extremely lethal. Most notable, though, are the weird and wonderful monsters. Some familiar creatures are in there. Will-o'-wisps, displacer beasts, doppelgangers, oozes, moulds, shriekers, things like that. There are a number of the more alien creatures from the Monster Manual as well. A mind flayer and an intellect devourer. But it's the new creatures that really stand out. The characterful veggie pygmies. There are a couple of tribes, different tribes, on the first level of the dungeon. And then there's the bizarre and lethal Frogimoth. However interesting the array of weird and wonderful enemies may be, they are probably not what will stick in players' memories, though, about this module. No, that'll be the gadgets. Various types of laser gun, grenade, power armor, anti-gravity belts, various sprays, handheld translators, batteries. You get the idea. And these are all waiting for the PCs to fathom out how to get them working. And this process is handled by a series of flowcharts to help determine the outcome of the pushing of buttons and the twiddling of knobs. Yes, it's largely random. But this aspect of the adventure is fun. My party's magic user almost took his own head off with a blaster rifle. <laughs> so, potentially lethal gadgetry, potent alien enemies, an array of destructive robots. S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, is one of the most relentlessly challenging modules I've ever run. Even the parts of the ship that are not actively trying to kill you can often still kill you. One of the reasons for the extreme lethality is the original intended use of the scenario as part of a convention tournament. I don't know how closely the published AD&D version resembled the original Metamorphosis Alpha scenario, but unlike many other adventures with such convention origins, S3 manages to hide this quite well. Convention adventures tend to be quite linear. And in S3, the routes between the levels of the ship are indeed linear. But the individual levels themselves are not. 
that characters have a great deal of freedom to explore and interact with the denizens and the equipment. But this has a knock-on effect on the DM. The ultra-fiddly map, the vast swathes of empty space, the lack of assistance from the text, these are all made exponentially worse by the complexity of the new equipment, the raft of potential effects that they have, and the unpredictable order in which they can be discovered. Preparation to run the adventure was slow and laborious, with far too much flicking of pages back and forth. And when it came to actually running the game, I was still having to check and recheck various items and effects, as it was difficult to commit all their traits and quirks to memory. Remember, these are new items. They're very much atypical to D&D magic items. They've got lots of different effects and side effects. And in order to describe them and for the party to interact with them as they should be, I had to be constantly referring to these items at the back of the adventure. Now imagine having to do this in a tournament situation for a group of 10 to 15 characters. It doesn't bear thinking about. Over the years, S3 has polarised opinion. Some people love the way it blended fantasy with science fiction, the way it inspired crossovers and demonstrated the freedom that DMs have in what they can include in the game. Others have been much more critical. It can be a bit of a campaign wrecker. It can throw out the long-term balance of a game, though I believe this is more in terms of the feel and the PC knowledge than anything else, as the most potent items that the party can find in there almost all have very limited charges, and most carry an inherent and significant risk in their usage. Yes, some of them are extremely powerful, but if they can't be recharged, for the adventure to work well, you need a group of players who will embrace its oddities and run with them. They must play dumb. They must refrain from using any personal sci-fi knowledge that they may have and act as their characters would in such an unfamiliar and otherworldly environment. And the DM should make every effort to assist with this. Describe the robots as metallic golems, for example. Fill your DMing with whooshing, buzzing and bleeping noises. Have whoop, whoop, whoop when alarms go off. Bzz, tunk, when doors open and close, and so on. Emphasise the language barrier between the party and the denizens. The PCs will also be familiar with magic, so use references to common magic spells in your descriptions. Laser beams can be long, oddly coloured magic missiles, for example. I believe I was lucky in that my group did play into this, and they I think they had a lot of fun in, in doing so. Now, I must mention now the work of one of my channel regulars, a certain grumpy old Slan. Hello, Slan. He has redrawn the maps in this adventure to make them readable and iron out some of the flaws because there are some errors in there. There were a few mistakes in the originals that made it past the editors. Now, I found his maps much, much easier to use. Here's level one, for example, with my annotations on it. This is what I used when running the game. I didn't use the original maps. If I'd been forced to use the original maps, I would probably have thrown the module at the wall, had a hissy fit, and refused to run the adventure. Ever. I'll put a link to Slan's channel below. He did a lengthy video about the work that he did fixing the maps, and I highly recommend his versions if you are thinking of running S3. So, to conclude, S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, is a beast of a module. It's incredibly difficult for both players and DMs. Every bit of it demonstrates the extremes of the hobby. From glorious artwork to abysmal maps. It's incredibly imaginative in places, but tediously empty in others. Equipment is described in the most intricate technical detail, but some of the encounter areas are desperately lacking. Is this module a classic? 
No. Is it a piece of flawed genius? Maybe. Is it a showcase of Gary Gygax's imagination and persistence? Definitely. It is simultaneously fun and frustrating, terrific and tiresome. If you wish to run this adventure, you need to know what you're getting yourself in for. You must be willing to put in a lot of time and effort to make it work. It doesn't have broad appeal. It has a niche appeal. Ultralithality, crossover with sci-fi, and the willingness to play dumb. You need a good group of players for this to work, and the DM needs to ideally be fairly experienced. So, I'm going to give S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, 6 out of 10. It has a lot of good stuff in there. It's just that the execution isn't the best. And yes, a DM should be expected to do work when preparing a module for play. But the amount of work is extreme with this adventure. I've been the old geek. Any comments regarding my review, please uh, chime in below. Check out uh, Grumpild Slan's channel as well. I'm sure he'll love the attention. <laughs> he doesn't do it for attention. He does it to be helpful. He's a nice guy. He's not grumpy at all. Anyway, if you want to play games with me, I have a Discord. There'll be a link below there. And uh, you're welcome to come along and play games. That's what the Discord is for. As I've already said, I've been the old geek. See ya!